You know, I've been around for a while. Met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you just might think that there's not much that can take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories, science and things that amaze and confound me. Every single day, incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night, some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Do monsters exist? In West Virginia, a town is terrorized by a seven-foot winged demon. Did it cause the death of 46 people? It had two huge black wings and no head, no arms. In Newfoundland, a macabre creature washes up on a local beach. Are our oceans concealing a mega beast? It was nothing that either of us had ever seen or could imagine. And in New Delhi, thousands are attacked by a metal clawed monster. Was it a man or a beast? People ran off in absolute panic. They just were fleeing from the sea. Yeah, it's a weird world, and I love it. You know, I just had a lovely holiday in Scotland. Edinburgh Castle, bagpipes, the whole deal. Even went to Loch Ness, where Nessie. Famous Loch Ness monster is supposed to live. We got on this boat, went out on the lock, searching for hours. Then guess what I saw? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Total waste of time. And six bucks. Are monsters nothing more than bait to lure gullible tourists? Do things like Yeti, Bigfoot, and Chupacabra exist? I got news for you. They just might. Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Nearly 50 years ago, this sleepy farming town was brutally awoken by a series of monstrous events that are still a mystery today. Lorne Coleman is an author. He documented the incidents, which began on the night of November 15th, 1966, when two young couples took a drive. Roger and Linda Scarber and the Mallets were driving around in the old TNT area. It was called TNT because that's where dynamite was stored during World War II. Secluded and dark, TNT was also a well-known lover's lane. But instead of fun, the four teenagers are about to encounter a living nightmare. All of a sudden, they see this creature that's six feet tall, and it's coming to them. It's having glowing red eyes in its chest, which are reflecting the headlights. It had two huge black wings, no head, no arms. All of a sudden, it goes into the air and starts flying. They start racing back to Point Pleasant, and the creature was in back of the car. Really, they felt it almost was touching both sides of the highway. Red glowing eyes, no arms, just these huge wings. Reaching speeds of 100 miles an hour, the chase continues until finally the creature disappears. Was there something unpleasant in Point Pleasant? The next day, they come back out there and they see it flying overhead. So all of a sudden, you get more and more kind of word of mouth in the town that this creature's been around, people are seeing it. Uh, the newspapers hadn't even caught on to the reports yet. So the next day, you have Marcella Bennett saying she's going over to one of her relatives' houses, which it's a bunch of houses right along the road that leads to the TMT. She gets close to the house and all of a sudden on the roof of the house sees the Mothman. She's carrying her baby in her arms and falls on the baby. 
out of terror and fright, gets up, races off, and they tell the police too. What occurs, however, is that it's then that it gets into the newspaper and all of a sudden you had within, you know, a few weeks, 200 people saying that they'd seen the Mothman. This remarkable story sends shockwaves through the town. The media calls the creature the Mothman. Local resident Fay Laporte was 14 years old at the time. Three days after the first sighting, she decided to visit the scene for herself. That's the road over there that we drove down, me and my brother, to come out here to try to find the so-called Mothman we heard about. My brother said, well, I'm just gonna see uh, if I can find it and prove that it's just somebody in a Halloween costume or something on wires or something. As we got to the, the area, my brother kept looking past me to the window. I said, well, what is it? What are you looking at? You know, he said, well, don't look right now. He said, but there's something beside the car there by the window. So he slammed the brakes on and just like it was nothing, just <laughs> leaped right up on the car. Even though it was dark, you could still see the eyes. The eyes held me. The most red, I mean, I can't explain the red. It just was such a red that it's, I mean, I just can't describe it. It's just like a color that you just, it looks like they're, they're really lit up, but it's not a glow, but it's perfectly lit up that you cannot miss it. And it's like, that's all you see when you look at it. It had the features of a bird combined with a human. We were really scared, and I was begging and crying for my brother to go ahead and, and let's get out here. That's when I finally saw it open up its wings and just flew off in the sky so pretty, and it was gone. For the next year, the Mothman terrorizes the people of Point Pleasant. We were coming up the road here, and we looked around the thing, around the curve there, and we thought it was a car light. So we stopped the car, and the thing came over the top of the car. Well, I just think it's a, something supernatural that we can't explain or something like that. I, I know I can't explain it, that's for sure. They wonder where it will all end. Thirteen months after the first sighting, they get their answer. The Silver Bridge between West Virginia and Ohio starting at Point Pleasant, collapsed on December 15th, 1967. 67 people fell into the water of the Ohio River. 46 died and two bodies never were even found. There's seemingly no apparent reason for this horrific tragedy. Then comes a terrifying report. The night before the disaster, the Mothman was seen hanging from the Silver Bridge. And people were scared. They were so scared they didn't want to talk about the bridge. They didn't want to talk about Mothman. They didn't want to talk about anything. They just, this town became quiet. And everybody for a long time said that nobody talked. And you still have people that won't talk about the bridge collapse today. The Mothman was never seen again. For 45 years, this incredible story has baffled experts. But some believe recent evidence could finally explain the mystery of the Mothman. Joe Nickel is a paranormal investigator with Skeptical Inquirer, Science Magazine. We human beings misperceive all the time. People say, I know what I saw. Actually, they know what they think they saw. Joe believes the Mothman wasn't quite the monstrous beast it was made out to be. I believe the barred owl is the creature that most clearly fits the bill. Was the Mothman simply an owl? Nickel thinks the answer lies in Linda Scarberry's first descriptions back in 1966. Her original description of Mothman is of a very large winged creature. She said it had no neck, virtually no real head, 
just eyes, very large eyes, round and shining like a bicycle reflector. In the owl family, there are different degrees of what's called eye shine. Among the most potent is that of the barred owl, which has a deep crimson eye shine. It's a large owl with big wingspan. It would look like just eyes set at the top of a body with wings up. It flies in a silent moth-like flight. It has pretty much exactly the characteristics of Mothman, the original sightings. But does Nichols' theory explain the height? Eyewitnesses reported a creature that was six or seven feet tall. We know that people misperceive, and I'm quite confident that somebody looking and not knowing what it is at night quickly and maybe being frightened by it, I dare say I would misjudge the distance and therefore misjudge the height. Keep in mind that the barred owl does not fly around with a yardstick in its claw for measurement purposes. So if you're looking at it and you don't know what it is, because it's a funny looking creature, so I think that people misperceive the distance and therefore misjudge the height. And they were excited and they kind of focused in on it and that also made it loom large in their consciousness. Barred owls were at the site. This was the McClinic Wildlife Preserve, overlaps with the, the TNT area and there were barred owls in that area. So. I would say this in summary, if it looked like a barred owl and acted like a barred owl and had red reflector eyes, maybe it was a barred owl. Incredible, isn't it? Here we have an entire town in fear of their lives from something that can't explain, a creature seven feet tall that can fly 100 miles an hour and maybe even bring down a bridge, and they blame it on this guy? Don't get me wrong, he's scary. If you're a field mouse, perhaps the real question here is, why did so many people think they saw a monster? And even blame it for the death of 46 people? Weird or what? A psychologist believes there's one sure way to solve the mystery of the Mothman, using fear. We're gonna try to induce a mild case of mass psychogenic illness. A mysterious winged creature called the Mothman terrorizes a town in West Virginia. Is it proof that monsters exist? Jim Hurat is a psychologist. He believes the Mothman can be explained by a phenomena called MPI. Mass psychogenic illness, or MPI, is a psychological term for an outbreak of mysterious illness that has no medical cause, but it's entirely in someone's head. Before you know it, you have a contagion effect, whereby those social symptoms start spreading in a large group of people. Mass psychogenic illness tends to be associated with negatives because people oftentimes report and care about and give a lot of credence to dramatic things in the environment. And oftentimes, just from our evolutionary standpoint, those are dangerous things, negative things. So when it comes to illness, that's something we want to avoid. So if we see someone get sick, that grabs our attention. Just like when we see something that might be paranormal, that grabs our attention too. Was Mothman the result of social contagion? Huron believes he can prove his theory by showing what might have happened in Point Pleasant. We're gonna to try to induce a mild case of mass psychogenic illness. I've selected a group of volunteers. I'm going to give them the suggestion that they're gonna be visiting a very haunted place in the woods. We're gonna take them out there and let their imaginations take over. What we should see if my mass psychogenic illness is a plausible explanation for the Mothman sightings is that we'll see a few people start having experiences, other people will notice that, and then we'll see an outbreak of similar symptoms, if that's what you want to call them, just due to social pressure. Was this fact? Was this fiction? Huron begins by telling the group he needs their help to solve a series of disturbing paranormal incidents reported in the area. As night falls, the group sets out into the woods. Everyone stop, please. Everyone fan out. They are told to turn off their flashlights. And stop. From this point, they can only be turned on when someone thinks they experience something paranormal. In just minutes, flashlights come on, and reports of paranormal activity flood in. 
Horan believes the flashlights act as social cues, which influence the other members of the group. You felt a cold breeze? Mm -hmm. Someone felt cold over there, too. I feel like someone is following me and someone is just waiting to say something. Like static electricity on my face. Let me understand this. Like right here, you feel like there's static electricity on your face? Mm -hmm. Is it as soon as one or two cues took hold, then you start seeing a flurry of other flashlights going on. It percolated throughout the entire group. Exactly what we would expect with psychogenic illness in a group. Tonight's experiments were very impressive because it kind of confirmed what I think happened with the Mothman. That is, we had the right type of people in the right type of environment, an environment that was spooky, full of context, exactly the same kind of environment that the Mothman experiences happen, and a little bit of suggestion caused a flurry, an outbreak of experiences that otherwise wouldn't have happened. It's exactly what I thought happened with Mothman. Was the Mothman all in the minds of its victims? And does this explain what eyewitnesses like Faye Laporte saw? Ken Gerhardt is a professional monster hunter. He believes the best way to solve the Mothman mystery is to hunt it down himself. For the past decades, I have gone out and searched for hard physical evidence that we share our world with creatures, legendary beasts, things that have not been classified or verified by scientists. Mothman is a monster in the truest sense of the word. I mean, here you have a creature that doesn't match the description of anything we know about in the natural world. Something that seemingly stepped right out of a science fiction movie. Mothman's main motivation seems to be to chase and terrify people and possibly leave a path of destruction and devastation in its wake. There are many people who blame Mothman for the collapse of the Silver Bridge and believe that there's an actually a death curse associated with the Mothman. So I would say yes, Mothman is the ultimate monster. Gearhart has come to the McClintic Wildlife Reserve, close to where the Mothman was first sighted. It's very exciting to be here uh, in the actual location where Mothman was reported so many times back in the 1960s. If Mothman is a real physical animal, it's gonna make an impact on its environment. And this could be tracks on the ground, nests, markings, and the like. Using a camera trap, Gearhart is hoping to catch Mothman unaware. This is actually a motion-activated camera with an infrared beam, and anything that passes within that beam is actually gonna be captured on this particular camera. I can put the camera out overnight and come back the following morning to determine whether, in fact, I've captured an image of the subject. To attract his prey, Gearhart sets up a blasting device, a machine that broadcasts the sound of forest creatures in pain. Uh, many of the eyewitnesses said the Mothman made kind of a squeaking mechanical mouse sound. And uh, fortunately, I have a little sound on here called lip squeak. And I think that's exactly what we need. Did you hear that? Something moving around there in the brush. I don't know what it was, but basically that last sound definitely evoked some type of response or reaction. With his equipment set, it is now a waiting game. Will the Mothman reveal himself? I don't know about you, but if I were a monster hunter, indeed, if I were hunting the Mothman, I think I'd be taking something a little more substantial than this. I mean, at least I think you take something like this. Wouldn't you? But we have to ask the question, if monsters really exist, why has no one, monster hunter or not, been able to catch one? Then again, if monsters were just ordinary critters, they wouldn't really be monsters, would they?
Returning the next day, monster hunter Ken Gearhart checks to see if he's found evidence of the Mothman. Huh. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we got anything on film. I, uh, I may have been a little bit wrong about the, the placement of this camera. Lesson learned here is that monster hunting is a very arduous and time-consuming process, and it may take quite a, quite a bit of time before we actually get an image of our quarry. The high-tech approach has failed to find anything, but Gearhart thinks he knows exactly what Mothman is. I believe Mothman to be the product of negative energy. Consider for a moment the main location where Mothman was encountered. Many of the Native American tribes would avoid this area completely because they believed it to be haunted by monsters and evil spirits. And then you have the great curse of Chief Cornstalk, the Shawnee chief who on his deathbed cursed the area because the white men had betrayed him. So in that respect, I believe Mothman to be the accumulation of all of this negative energy perhaps brought to life by some type of mechanism far beyond the realm of human comprehension. Beyond that, there have been reports of winged humanoid creatures all over the world for centuries. And in many ancient cultures, for example in Japan, where you have the Tengu, which is a bird man, the Tengu is often considered to be a bad omen or a harbinger of doom. You have the Banshee from Scottish lore. And so in many of these mythologies and folklores, these winged creatures are often considered to be premonitions of doom and destruction. So I think that's a very interesting tie-in between Mothman and the timing of the bridge collapse. Was Mothman a bad omen that somehow materialized in Point Pleasant? Or could it simply have been mass hysteria created by an owl? Weird, or what? A fisherman finds a giant, unidentifiable creature on a beach in Newfoundland. It was nothing that either of us had ever seen or could imagine. Are monsters lurking in the deep? Ah, hey, whoa. You know, I used to love fishing. Nothing better than the thrill of landing a big one, the ultimate challenge between man and beast. Well, every now and then you catch something you're not expecting. Strange things that make you wonder what is living in the depths of our oceans? I don't know. In 2001, Gary Stenson was working as a fisheries officer in Newfoundland, Canada, when he received the strangest phone call of his career. Got a call from a fisherman. He was telling me about a creature on the beach that had washed up. He started to describe it to me, and it sounded unlike anything that I had encountered. Mystified, Gary decides to meet the fisherman and investigate the strange sighting. It was a very isolated area, and as we came up to it, we saw this large creature laying on the beach itself. I've never seen anything that looked like this. The whole thing was tapering to the, to the tail end. And uh, once it got to the tail end, it just broke off. We had thought that it might be something like a giant squid, which we do have here, but there are no tentacles that looked like that. Uh, it didn't also look like a whale or a shark, which it could be. There was nothing that looked like a head. There was nothing that looked like any sort of structures that we, that we could identify it. In over 20 years, as a fisheries officer, Gary thought he had seen it all until now. I've worked on a lot of whales, and I've worked on a lot of seals, and even some sharks that have come ashore, but this creature was nothing like that, and there was nothing that we could tell where it came from. From a distance, it had what looked like hair um, standing up all over it. It was about five and a half meters long, about two meters wide, and about a meter high in the middle of it. There were a number of lobes. They looked almost like short arms with notches in between. It smelt a lot like rotting tissue. 
It was pretty heavy. We tried pushing on it. It was solid. Uh, it was nothing that we could move. So what we did was we took our knives and we tried to cut up and cut into the tissue. As they cut into the carcass, they made a bizarre discovery. The exterior of it was very hard. It was quite tough, but there was no sign of any organs. If it was a shark, there'd be cartilage, but there was no cartilage. So we looked for bone. If it was a whale, there'd be some bone in it, but there, none of this either. We spent a lot of time trying to decide what we thought it might be. And of course, as a scientist, you're very curious. And in fact, that's a sign of a good, of a good scientist to me is somebody who is curious about what they see. And of course, we were very curious as to what this might be. So we decided that the best thing to do would be to take some tissue with it. And uh, we brought that back with us. It seemed Gary and the fishermen had discovered a creature unknown to science. It was nothing that either of us had ever seen or could imagine. It's not impossible that there's something out there that we haven't seen before that's lurking in the depths. A giant creature washes up in Newfoundland. Was it an unknown species or a monster from the deep? And if there was one, could there be others? Remarkably, the answer is yes. It's incredible. In the last century, giant weird blobs of, ooh, wow, I don't know what, have been washing up all over the planet. Are they something awful from the bowels of ships? I hope not. In fact, they're so hard to identify that the only name scientists could come up with is globsters. Part glob, part monster. Globster, clever. Hmm? Well, what the hell are they? Matthew Adell is a professor of anatomy. He believes the explanation is simple. It sounds like something very mysterious, something completely unknown to science. There are dozens of reports of globsters from around the world going back over a century. They're usually formless and they don't contain any bones. There's no evidence of a head or a tail or any limbs. They're just big shapeless globs of flesh. But there's no evidence so far that they're anything other than dead whales. But if globsters are whales, how could tons of bones and internal organs be missing? Waddell thinks the answer lies in one of the strongest elements in nature, collagen, a protein found in whale skin. Collagen is similar to steel in terms of tensile strength, so it's one of the toughest substances known to man. If you feel the back of your heel, feel your Achilles tendon, that's a big rope of collagen the size of your finger. Now imagine something like that woven in overlapping belts around an animal 100 feet long, and you get some idea of the strength of whale skin. It's just incredible. Scientists think protective collagen allows whales to dive up to two miles below the surface of the ocean. Many submarines would crush before they got down to that depth. Collagen is their pressure suit when they dive and their armor against things like sharks that would try to take bites out of them. Waddell also believes collagen causes whales to decompose in a unique way. Decomposition for whales is an interesting process because whales are different from other animals in two ways mainly. The first is that they're so big, just their sheer scale influences how they decompose. The other thing is the skin of whales is unique in the animal kingdom. It's incredibly thick, it's incredibly strong. You can hang up the entire weight of a whale by a hook through its skin. When a whale dies, the skin doesn't fall apart the way that normal animal skin does. After death, scavengers rapidly devour the insides of a dead whale. But they leave the grisly collagen alone. And once animals have eaten their way into the body to get the good stuff, it's easy for the bones to slide right out and sink to the bottom of the ocean. The skin falls off like a sock off of a foot. And now you have a 100-foot-long tube of skin 
floating through the ocean. But many globsters have tentacles, strange arms, even hair. Can Waddell's theory explain these bizarre features? Imagine the gnarliest piece of gristle you've ever encountered that's 100 feet long and a foot thick. It lasts essentially forever. It's only broken up, really, by getting pounded on rocks and torn apart by waves. That sack of skin can float around in the ocean for months or maybe even years. It can rip, it can tear, it can shred into all kinds of interesting shapes. And the collagen actually frays, just like an old pair of pants. And those threads of collagen that stick out are usually pink or red, and they look like hair. Are globsters simply giant blobs of collagen floating around in a suit of whale skin? Or are they beasts from the deep? I love a good mystery as much as the next person. And I would love to think that there are giant unknown animals in the ocean. And there probably are some new kinds of sharks and maybe even new species of whales. But there's no real sea monster. As much as I would like to believe that there is, I have to go where the evidence leads. And so far, all of the evidence that we have suggests that globsters are just the rotting skin of dead whales. Are globsters simply masses of mammal meat? Some believe they are proof of something far more terrifying. It would absolutely be a monster. Strange creatures called globsters are washing up on beaches all over the world. Are they simply dead whales? Dr. Hans Larsen is a paleontologist. He thinks globsters could be a living relic from our ancient past. The researchers who, who point to globsters and say they're nothing more than whales, uh, they're probably right for most cases. But pretty much the entire ocean below 100 meters depth hasn't been explored. Some areas of the ocean are over six miles deep. Larson believes that a terrifying creature could be lurking in the depths. The Megalodon. Megalodon is a huge fish. It looks a lot like a great white shark, but it's much bigger. It is known as the Tyrannosaurus Rex of the Deep, a monster that terrorized the ocean for 25 million years, and the right size for a globster. This is a tiger shark, about 15 or so feet long. And look at the size of the teeth and the size of the mouth. So it's pretty impressive. I mean, this would be scary enough in the water should you be in front of it. But compare that to a megalodon, and this is an average size tooth. It would absolutely be a monster. Most scientists believe this marine monster became extinct one and a half million years ago. But remarkably, Larson isn't so sure. Some people have suggested that the cooling of the oceans may have driven Megalodon to extinction. I think we should be a little bit skeptical about that because all the other animals in the ocean survive quite well. And if that whole ecosystem could survive the global cooling of the oceans and the ice ages, why not Megalodon? Could science be wrong? Another giant of the deep, the coelacanth was supposed to have died out 65 million years ago with the dinosaurs. But then in 1938, a fisherman hauled one up. Are megalodons alive? Could globsters be washed up remains of a 25 million year old living fossil? We have glimpses of some other fishes down there, uh, other sharks and other non-shark fishes but we know practically nothing about them. Uh, I think that, that that world is just unexplored. If the megalodon uh, was one animal down there that, that we didn't know about, there could be a huge range of other animals as well, uh, non-air breathing animals, things like other squids, other fishes, uh, both sharks and non-shark fishes, uh, other invertebrates, who knows what, what, what other kinds of um, crab-like animals or, or arthropods or, or jellyfish animals are down there. We just have no clue. Giant killers lurk in our oceans. Are they monsters of the deep or just globs of super strength blubber? Weird or what? No. 
In India, a rampaging man-beast causes widespread panic in the nation's capital. They scream and cry and run off. You know, it was absolute panic. Are scientists creating man-made monsters? You know, when it comes to trying to prove there's no such thing as monsters, there's one big problem. There's just no hard evidence. They never seem to hang around long enough. But what if we're looking in the wrong places? What if instead of creepy shadows or deep dark corners of our imagination, the monsters we're looking for are right under our noses? What if we're the ones creating them? Sanal Adamaruku is a journalist. He was in Delhi in the summer of 2001 and witnessed one of the most bizarre events in its long history. It became very, very warm. The temperatures went up to 48 degrees Celsius with enormous humidity, which made life unbearable. Nobody could sleep in home, especially the poor section of the, the, the town. A lot of people have been sleeping on the rooftop. As thousands of people try to escape the heat, they have no idea a six-week reign of terror is about to begin. Two factory workers said that they have been sleeping on the factory um, balcony in the evening, and suddenly some strange creature jumped from the floor to the second floor and scratched them, attacked them, screamed and went off. In a city home to thousands of monkeys, at first the attack seemed unremarkable until the victims described what they had seen. And they said that it had uh, two, three special things. Metallic clothes, then a special light coming from its forehead, one green and the other red. And these lights were moving, and it scratched, made a special whistling sound and disappeared. The story was like a wildfire. It spread everywhere. People have been speaking about this special creature. What had attacked the workers? Within 24 hours, the newspapers give the creature a name, the Monkey Man. The very next night, it strikes again. By the end of the week, there are reports of a dozen more attacks. People were so afraid, so afraid. People ran off in absolute panic. They just were fleeing from the scene. They scream and cry, and hearing this sound, people shut off the windows, close lights. You know, it was absolute panic. All the victims described the same thing. A hairy creature with metallic claws and strange lights. Everybody has been speaking about uh, uh, the special kind of movement that it has, as if it's controlled by somebody. Some people said that it could be a half-man, half-robot and especially created by the neighboring country, Pakistan, to make trouble in India. But then comes a new twist. As rumors grow, so does the panic. Just two weeks after the first sighting of the Monkey Man, the entire city of New Delhi is besieged by terror. So many people have been injured. Uh, initially, every night, we had five to six people got attacked by the monkey man with scratches, bruises, and other, other body damages. And the number increased. Later, per night, there have been 120, 130, I mean, people got attacked by the monkey man. And there have been more than 800 people hospitalized at different parts of the time. Then, tragedy strikes. One lady was on a rooftop sleeping and someone saw the monkey man, screamed, and the whole people started running off. She had been running off. And she fallen down from the second floor, straight down, hitting the floor, and she died. In the following days, more people die as crowds rush to escape. As panic grows, New Delhi becomes a ghost town. People were so afraid to come out. The Delhi streets were completely empty after 8 o'clock. Totally empty. Not even a car would go out. The whole city was completely afraid of Monkey Man. Then, just as the terror reaches its peak, the incredible happens. 
there was no monkey man reported anywhere after third or fourth week of May and it simply disappeared. What happened in New Delhi? Something held this giant city in its fearful grip for weeks. Was it a monster? Could the monkey man be real? Jay Lakani is a teacher of the Hindu religion. He believes the monkey man can be explained by Indian culture. There is nothing here that would make me feel that there's anything more than superstition, kind of rolled up with fear and rolled up with this idea of religious iconography, which has kind of produced this story. Lakani thinks that powerful religious beliefs could have helped create the monkey man. In the Hindu tradition, the word avatar is very central. Avatar means one who descends. The Hindus say the spirit has a habit of descending to earth in human form. In the Hindu religion, gods known as avatars are believed to descend to earth in times of need. Many are depicted as part human, part animal. Was the monkey man a well-meaning avatar that was mistaken for something evil? India is a poor country struggling with lots of issues, so it's understandable that the public would like to project the idea that an avatar is here to rescue them. Any sober Hindu, when he looks at the story in a very sober manner, will immediately come to the conclusion that this was not an avatar. It's not just my take on it, but every sober Hindu, no sober Hindu would really consider this to be an avatar because there is nothing that the monkey has done which in a way reflects what an avatar is all about, which is to benefit humanity, not frighten it. You see, a lay person is very, very gullible. I suspect it is quite possible that a few pranksters got together, dressed up a couple of monkeys and had set them loose on the streets of New Delhi. But for a lay person who is kind of steeped in religious tradition, it is understandable that suddenly when he sees a few pranksters, he somehow projects his own idea that this is an avatar on the streets of New Delhi. Were thousands of New Delhi residents victims of pranks blown out of proportion by widely held religious beliefs? Did the monkey man exist at all? I don't think the monkey man existed at all. I think all these things combined with a few real monkeys kind of jumping about and perhaps some pranksters getting into the, onto the act is the reason why we have got this story developing in India as an avatar coming down to earth. So is that the end of this mystery? Maybe not. Could Monkey Man be a product of the human imagination in a different way? Not a religiously inspired delusion, but a manifestation of the dark side of science. Recently declassified documents hint at some kind of twisted Soviet genetic experiment. Was the monkey man a secret weapon that escaped the evil lab of a mad scientist that spawned him? Is that weird? Or what? In New Delhi, thousands of people claim to have been attacked by a metal clawed monster known as the Monkey Man. Was it simply mass hysteria or religious superstition? Scott Marlowe is a cryptozoologist with a remarkable theory. I believe monsters exist. Uh, they may not necessarily be the, the Saturday or Friday night movie version of the monsters that uh, terrify us on the silver screen. But there are things out there that go bump in the night that are terrifying, to say the least. When I first heard the story of India's Monkey Man, I was pretty certain I knew exactly what it was. Marlowe's theory is controversial and alarming. He thinks the Monkey Man is a real-life monster created by us. Monsters exist, and we certainly have the ability now with genetic engineering to create them. Based on some of the descriptions, there's a distinct possibility that monkey men could be some kind of human-ape hybrid. Could someone have created a creature half man, half ape? And if so, why? Incredibly, 
this concept isn't as weird as it sounds. It could even be based in fact. Declassified Russian military files have allegedly revealed that in the 1920s, Joseph Stalin secretly tried to create a super soldier. The super soldier is a genetically engineered creature uh, that is designed with a military purpose in mind. Stalin commissioned a scientist to attempt a hybridization uh, who went to Africa, collected uh, ape DNA, and then attempted to impregnate uh, human women with the sperm of these chimps that he collected the material from. They were trying to create a soldier that uh, had superhuman strength. They wanted the strength of an ape, which is known to be about seven times that of a human, uh, with the intelligence of a human. Incredibly, Marlow believes Stalin wasn't the only one who was messing with nature. And not to be outdone by the Russians, we attempted to do the same thing. The attempt was not successful uh, by all accounts, uh, but a lot of that had to do with the lack of knowledge on the genetics. Today, it could probably be done. Are scientists using modern technology to create super soldiers from humans and apes? Could this explain the monkey man? Some of the evidence that the uh, monkey man is a human-ape hybrid could be that they are frequently reported wearing some sort of helmet uh, or flashing lights and that kind of thing, which would probably be some sort of communications device. The most alarming feature that's reported are metal claws. That is, seems more of a military weapon. If such experimentation were going on and these uh, creatures were intelligent enough, as presumably they would be, uh, to escape from the facility that was creating them, they could certainly account for the monkey men. Was the monkey man an escaped super soldier? And why, in an age of predator drones and nuclear bombs, would India need one? Creating a super soldier using uh, hybridization genetics would probably be a good solution uh, for a country like India where, yeah, they belong to the nuclear club, but it's not a very popular solution to solving one's problems as a country. A super soldier might be engineered for stealth purposes. They could uh, pursue this type of a thing, uh, especially since uh, in India, you know, monkeys and apes running around are not at all unusual. Uh, they could infiltrate, they could blend in, they could perform a number of different things uh, in terms of intelligence gathering or otherwise performing some sort of military function without going detected. I do know if monkey men had been created with uh, genetic engineering for a military purpose, I would be extremely concerned, if not deathly afraid, of the outcome. Was a hybrid man-ape let loose on the streets of New Delhi? Are we creating man-made monsters? Weird, or what? So there we have it, monster stories from all over the world. In West Virginia, a winged monster seven feet tall with red eyes terrorizes the town of Point Pleasant. In Newfoundland, a mysterious giant mass of flesh emerges from the depths of the ocean. And in India, a half man, half beast attacks thousands and sends an entire city into panic. Are these bizarre stories evidence that monsters exist? Can we dismiss thousands of eyewitnesses who claim these things are true? You decide.
Join me again next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what? <laughs>